Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. It's lovely to have you join me today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon. And I'd also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron-only monthly giveaways. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Catherine Davies to the show to talk about Tudor war paintings. Catherine Davies is a heritage and planning consultant working principally in the public sector. She came across many war paintings during the course of her work in Shropshire, and because of the lack of information on this subject, she started her own research. She now works as a consultant on planning and historic environment issues. Catherine is a visiting fellow at Kellogg College, Oxford, and has lectured widely on her professional and research interests. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Catherine. How are you? Very good, thank you. Though the weather's changed here, it's definitely autumnal autumnal now yes we're into spring here quite a quite a warm spring I must say straight away so that's quite nice but um let's just let's start with you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background I, I started out life as a um, in planning uh, and then moved on to building conservation which seems a long way I know from Tudor wall paintings but I was working in Shropshire and I kept coming across wall paintings in mostly derelict houses uh, these were really early houses and I think what you know what are these telling us that you know like a good conservation officer I had to understand the building and what the messages it's giving to us but nobody could tell me so that actually led me to start doing some research for my doctorate at Oxford on this so that's how I started do my research on wall paintings and I've worked with in building conservation ever since. Wonderful. And I recently I recently read your really fantastic book on Tudor wall paintings. And um, can you tell us a little bit about some of those common characteristics that you talked about when it comes to Tudor wall paintings? Yeah, sure. Yes, when I started looking at these, people sort of said, oh, they're like church wall paintings. Oh, it's after the Reformation. They've just transferred it to the houses. But when I looked, they, they were different. And it's a very specific period from like the sort of mid 16th century to the early 17th century. There was this very specific type of wall painting that had like a frieze and then there was a main panel and maybe like a skirting or a dado. And it's like the uh, this sort of tripartite arrangement of space is like the Renaissance organisation of space. So the the frieze was often separated from the main panel by a, a little sort of decorative band. And before this, paintings in churches, particularly if they were telling a story, they were in what we call registers. So it would be one on top of the other. And important people were shown at a larger size than, than less important people. So they've got very different characteristics. And also any text pre-Reformation was in Latin. And after the Reformation, it was never in Latin. After the first quarter or so of the 17th century, the 
sort of big, bold, bright patterns that the Tudors painted on their walls became out of fashion, playing wash and panelling. So you get very architecturally conscious painting. You don't get a lot of it. And so I, I sort of intrigued by this. And I, there's, there's some paintings that are actually dated. They're not that, I have to hasten to, to add, it's not the date of the house, it's the date when the painting was done. And all the ones that are dated between sort of 1550 and 1620 have this tripartite arrangement of space. There are none dated before then. There's a few dated after then, and they are architectural features like an overmantle or heraldry. So these very specific characteristics just occur in that sort of 50, 60 year period. And you also, when you're talking about these wall paintings in your book, you say that they can generally be divided into five main categories, which you go on to describe as figurative, decorative, architectural motifs, texts and heraldry. Obviously, you go into a lot of detail about these in your book, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about these different groupings? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I grouped them like that because there, there had been some early work done on understanding wall paintings by someone called Clive Rouse. He wrote sort of in the 30s and then up to the 50s. And he he used this category to organise the paintings that he'd looked at. And all the wall paintings do have these categories. I'm not sure how useful they are because I've realised that most paintings have come from more than one category. Decorative paintings are by far the largest group and a lot of those are floral motifs which are imitating textiles. It was very popular for the wealthy to have woven textiles on their wall to keep the rooms warmer and these had sort of floral motifs on them. So a lot of wall paintings are imitating those. The other sort of main decorative one is antique work or grotesque work which I don't know whether people know what that is but it's a name given to the Renaissance sort of decoration that became very popular in the 16th century, coming from Italy when they were discovering antiquity. You know, they discovered Nero's palace, the ruins of that in the 1490s, and that's why it's called antique work. This sort of decoration was painted on the walls, and so it was given the name antique work because it came from the antiques, the Romans, or also grotesque work because it was from a, a cave, a grotto. Figurative schemes. Um, are often depicted against a decorative background. And quite often these also incorporate heraldic devices. Architectural motifs are interesting in that quite often the figurative schemes are presented in an architectural setting. So you might get sort of columns with an arcade and then a figure within that or two figures within that or part of the story within that. But architectural motifs on their own are not, not that common. And texts are pretty well always associated with one of the other categories. Most commonly in a frieze, you will find a text in a decorative border going around the room, usually a moralising text. And how did um, improvements in housing technology at this point contribute to the rise in popularity of these paintings? Because it seems that they were kind of everywhere, really, at this point. You're right, they were. Um, I think anybody who had a house that was built in anything like permanent construction would have had wall paintings on the wall. And that's a good question because it, the, the second half of the 16th century saw a major improvement in housing conditions. Before that, and even during the later 16th century, the hearth, the fire, the main point of the house, which is the fire, was an open fire in the middle of the room, an open hearth with the smoke going out, making its way out through the, the roof uh, and maybe some windows at the side. But the inside of houses was very sooty, smoky and dirty. At the same time, you've got windows were very small and very few ordinary houses had glass because it was prohibitively expensive. So they would have either wooden shutters, sometimes you'd get a um, thin horn filling um, a window, or you could get waxed cloth. But the inside of a house, you couldn't see it. So there was very little point in decorating the walls of a house. You can't see it. Gradually, in the, during the late, later part of the 16th century, houses were improved by putting the fire within a, a hearth, a, a chimney stack. So it was going up, the smoke was going up a stack. And improvements in making glass meant that it became more affordable and more people had glass in their windows. So for the first time, you could probably see the inside of the house. And so in terms of who's commissioning these actual paintings, who are the people and, and why would they commission these paintings for their homes? 
the founding houses of all social status. So I think it was anybody who, as I say, had a house that you could see the inside. Um, it wasn't all covered in soot and smoke. Would have had a wall painting. So you find them in grand houses, but you also find them in quite humble cottages. And you also find them in inns and alehouses where you you often find a painting that's got a, a good story to it. And you can imagine people sat round in a winter's evening having a drink and discussing, you know, discussing the wall painting. One of them that I have I've sort of came across in Essex has got a, a picture of Adam and Eve, you know, so it's a good story and it could be like a moralising text, but also it was quite a sexy Eve that was drawn on the walls. So you can imagine that, um, you know, it certainly it is, um, in our houses, they were a good focus for a story. You know, if you've just redone your house, you're really proud of it. You've got sort of nice plastered walls for the first time. You'd, you'd want to decorate it. And so whether it was a humble cottage or a farmhouse, whatever, you know, they wanted to show off. And is there a pattern in terms of what rooms the paintings are actually found in? Yeah, that's quite significant, actually, because although, you know, a house might have quite a few rooms, not everybody in the household would have access to all the rooms. There was a very strict code about who could go in what room. So if you take a typical farmhouse, it would have a hall, uh, a parlour, and then chambers above and a kitchen and outhouses. So anybody who came to the house would be invited into the hall. And you, you very frequently got wall paintings in halls. Only the householder and his family and maybe some favoured guests would be invited into a parlour. And again, you find a different sort of wall painting there. The same again with chambers. That's even more private. That was definitely the householder and his family and favoured guests would have access to a chamber. However, there was some, it depends how the wall painting was used, some of the wall paintings with a religious content might have been used for sort of daily worship. Um, there was a big move to sort of reinforce Protestantism at the sort of vernacular level. So a householder would be expected to be responsible for the religious instruction of his household, just to keep on the right side and make sure everybody knew that he was signed up to a Protestant religion. Many would have moralising texts and maybe a religious image. And this could be used for sort of daily instruction. He gathered the household together, maybe have a Bible reading, or use the wall painting to explain a particular aspect of some text. And if this was in his chamber or in a parlour, then he would gather the whole household there, not necessarily just his family. So yes, they were found in all different rooms, but not really in the kitchen, you know, because you weren't trying to impress anybody there. And tell us a little bit about what you found out about the people who are actually creating these wall paintings. So, yeah, they weren't really artists. And when you see some of them, they are extraordinarily crude. You can see that they definitely were not artists. It was mostly uh, local building craftsmen. So you would have plasterers, plumbers, glaziers, Anybody who's got sort of good hand-to-eye coordination. And there are quite a lot of records of the Paint Stainers Company in London having a go at people who are pinching their work. So there's a great long list of, of workmen, of craftsmen, including, let's say, plasterers, bricklayers, plumbers, embroiderers, people who are familiar with patterns. That said, there were quite a lot of dedicated painters in the early modern period, in the marches, but they were mostly connected, I think, to heraldic work. People were very keen on displaying their ancestry and um, you get quite a lot of pedigrees. You know, they would be employed painting pedigrees and also hatchments in churches. You know, when there was a funeral, there was a hatchment there and heraldic shields. So the fine, finer work was done by dedicated painters. And there are some wall paintings that are clearly done by skilled painters. But I would say the vast majority were done by building craftsmen, some perfectly competent and some not so. 
Yes, there's quite a big difference in the in the quality, isn't there? Because you, you obviously include lots of photos, which is so wonderful about your book, A Whole Gazetteer. And it was fun looking at all the pictures thinking, oh, this one looks like it may have been designed by a child, but then, you know, <laughs> others that are much more complex. So in terms of the designs, what sources did the artists and the craftspeople use for inspiration? You talked about those floral designs, possibly inspired by textiles and that kind of thing. But what else did they have at hand? Do you know, that's a really interesting question because people didn't have books. Well, you know, not they weren't common. We didn't have sort of magazines to flick through for designs. So it's really interesting to think how visual material was disseminated because I have found, you know, really weird designs, what I thought were weird designs in Shropshire and in Kent and in Essex, the same one. So it's not the same person doing it. It's a different hand. Um, I've looked at pretty well all the printed material that there was in the early modern period. And yes, some's taken from printed material, subject and ornament prints, which you can you can actually trace them back to, and that's quite a big game. So there was Italian art architect Serlio published um, ceiling prints, patterns for ceilings, which he'd, he'd sort of clearly taken from Roman remains um, and these were widely used in Italy as ceiling patterns for plaster. This was sort of very popular when it was uh, printed in England and those prints form the basis for lots of geometric designs that we find on the walls. So they've taken the ceiling pattern and put it on the walls. So the title pages of books were another source of design. The title page was made up of different compartments that could be put together different ones for different title pages and they I have found exact copies particularly for a frieze because it's sort of horizontal and lends itself to a a horizontal pattern so the horizontal pattern block of a a title page could be used uh, as the inspiration for a wall painting. Uh, We've mentioned textiles and it's not just the sort of big floral design what they're imitating, imitating is also the woven strip because where you get fictive textiles, they are in stripes, alternating colours or patterns. And this is reflecting the actual woven textiles that appear on the walls. Early cloth was woven in quite narrow strips, you know, sort of between uh, maybe 14, 20 inches. I think that was the maximum, you know, the average size, but that's the maximum. And then these were sewn together or tied together to, to be hung on the walls. So you got uh, and it's more decorative, they do different different patterns. So you actually find this, this imitated on the walls, you get different stripes, and that's what I have found, the same pattern in, in, in stripes, which I couldn't make out in Shropshire, and then I find it in Kent, and what's, what's this about? And they are the sort of typical weaves that you find in these sort of early damasks, you know, pomegranates, these sort of big decorative flowers, a big scale. So fictive textiles were very common, um, fictive architectural features, and so that was, they would have been taken from real examples, possibly in the church, because that's where most people would come across some sort of quite fine architectural detail. The church uh, was another source of wall painting design, because although we're post-Reformation and people feel, you know, churches were all whitewashed over, actually only the iconic images were whitewashed over. And a lot of the incidental ornament, you know, sort of chevrons and scrolly, scrolly bits, they weren't, they weren't washed, washed over. You know, they may have lasted, well, they may have lasted till well into the 17th and possibly even later. Some, some innocent patterns did survive, but it was only the iconic stuff that was whitewashed over. So churches would have been a source of design. You might also get building craftsmen who'd worked, say, on a, I found one example, for example, in Shrewsbury, where a very fine antique work design, and then a much simpler design, probably done by the same craftsman in another house, but not quite as fine. So existing houses could be a source of design. And you talked about some of those common design elements that you see across different counties, I suppose you could say. So tell us a little bit more about those and also colour choices. I found your discussion of all the colours that were used really, really fascinating as well. Yeah, the the, the colours, it depended again. There was a vernacular palette, which I think I identified, which if you didn't have a lot of money, you know, you couldn't afford the very expensive pigments. So cheap and cheerful was the order of the day. And so mineral pigments like 
the ochres, which were so cheap. You know, you get red ochre and yellow ochre. And if you burn those, you get sort of a range of colours from the sort of yellows, oranges, dark browns. You know, it goes right through. So, so you find ochre based colours very commonly. Black from charcoal was used as sort of cut or, or some sort of carbon. It could be lamp black or charcoal that was used. And that could be mixed with lime to make sort of shades of grey. And it also could be a bluey grey as well. And then you got red lead, which you know, is a very bright orange red. That was around because people used it to preserve timber. So you could put a bit of red lead, give a really bright colour. And though that was sort of relatively expensive, it was to hand. And you only needed a bit of pigment to go a long way, went a long way. And the other colours that were commonly found were, well, Rosette is one, which is a colour we don't know, but it was an absolute flame sort of orange red, which the Elizabethans absolutely loved because it was so bright and vibrant. But then there is actually a lawsuit, somebody being sued because the, they'd ordered this nice bright orange flame colour, fantastic. And then a few months later, it was just completely gone. It was very, very fugitive. So organic pigments were very fugitive. They loved them, lovely bright colours, but they didn't last. You know, wall paintings weren't meant to last, actually. I think they were only intended as temporary decoration. And so waste from dyers, vats, you know, would have been used to colour the uh, a lime wash and to sort of bring a colour. So, you, you know, you get the brighter colours from, from those pigments, really permanent pigments. You were just mixing those, that I, the, the mineral pigments I've main, mentioned. You could get some a, a good range of colours. You do get other pigments that are much more expensive, vermilion, blue bice, you get sort of tin yellow. These are bright mineral pigments, but you just would have a little bit to touch up. There were a lot of pigments available, but for the most part, they were done with this vernacular palette. I mean, do you want me to say something about the sort of temporary nature of that I think they were Absolutely, only intended? Absolutely, yes. Uh, because, you, you know, you, you go to all that trouble to do this painting all over your wall and you, you'd think, right, that's it. But actually, I mentioned that Fires were sort of enclosed in hearths, which sort of got rid of most of the soot and smoke from the room. But actually, anyone who's, you know, lived in a house with an open fire knows how dirty they do get. The rooms do get, you still get soot and smoke deposits. And that was the case in the early modern period. You've got a nice clean wall, nice new wall painting. But in a relatively short space of time, it would get very dirty, sooty, there'd still be soot deposits on it. And so it was just whitewashed over and another di design put on top. And I, I have, think I found fairly concrete evidence for within a 50 year period, I found sort of three schemes. So you've got a whitewash base, then you've got the pigment, then you've got soot and smoke deposits, then you've got a whitewash pigment, soot and smoke deposits, a whitewash. So suggesting, you know, it was redone quite regularly because they were cheap and cheerful. And that's why I think sometimes people would have the nice bright colours and they'd fade. You know, they'd get them from the dyer down the road, but, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't last. And you can see some paintings now where they've used mineral pigments, but touched up with an organic one, and that's just disappeared. So the, the design is incomplete. I thought that was really fascinating how it was just seen as a temporary sort of fix or a temporary decoration. So given that it was painted several times within like the 50 years, like you said, how much did this actually cost? Yeah, that's an interesting question as well, because I think there's a huge range of costs. So some, not a lot. Pigments could be very cheap. So the time, it was the time taken to do it that would have been the cost. I think like ochre was something like two pence a tonne you know, at the time. So talking of costs, if you just to sort of gauge it, a craftsman might be paid between 10 pence and 12 pence a day on average. I mean, that's over that period, somewhere around there. Um, so the cost would be a function of what pigments you're using and how complex your design is. And I, I did actually try to work this out by near me in the Shropshire Hills lived someone who did do wall paintings for a living, you know, in churches. And so he he reproduced some schemes for me. We, we sort of did an experiment with lining paper that's got the same absorbency as a, a, a lime surface and how much pigment we used and how long it took to do sort of these very simple swirls or scroll patterns, 
and then how long it took to do more complex ones. So I costed up a, a range of schemes. So in a typical farmhouse, a room, an ordinary sort of chamber with a sort of scroll pattern on it might have cost two shillings and sixpence. I think we worked it out. So that's the equivalent of like three days wages, if we can sort of translate that. A simple ceiling decoration, which is just sort of brush strokes quite effective and very sort of striking. I think I, in, a, in a large room, I worked that out, so that actually cost in total three pence, you know, so that's a massive impact at very little cost. But if you wanted antique work, even though that was quite often badly done, because it's quite complicated, that would cost quite a lot. I think that I worked out one at 18 shillings and six pence, so that's like 18 to 20 days wages. So uh, and at the end of it, it you know, it wasn't fine work by any means, but it's very complicated. It was generally within the purse of most house owners to have some form of decoration. And you also speak about painted cloths, which was really fascinating. So could you tell us a little bit about what these were and how they were actually used? Painted cloths are a bit of an enigma because there's hardly any around. Uh, yet they were almost universal in the 16th century, particularly useful for keeping drafts out of houses. They would hang, like the fictive textiles that I've mentioned, people would have, they couldn't afford those, painted cloths, which would be sort of plain linen, and they would decorate them, again, quite cheaply. And they would maybe have them round at the high end of the hall, you know, where, where, they, where the householder sat. And they, they did have all sorts of patterns, but for the most part, they served the function of draft excluding rather than decoration. And we have a few scraps left in the Victorian Albert Museum, hardly any, because they just got covered in soot and smoke and disintegrated. So looking at probate inventories from the late 16th, early 17th century, you can see, I think in, in, in Stratford, there were about 8% of the probate inventories mentioned painted cloths. And that just disappeared, you know, dropped radically in the 17th century as people's houses, housing conditions improved and they didn't need painted cloths. That said, there was a slight revival of them in the late 17th century, which are different altogether. They're different from wall paintings because they were produced in a workshop and they're all of the same sort and they are definitely late 17th century. Whereas the wall paintings that someone chose to put on their walls said something about their status, something about them, and it served a function. Painted cloths were bought off the shelf, so they weren't commissioned by the owner. So it's not the same thing at all. You know, there's, there's the, the very important messages contained in wall paintings telling us about the person who commissioned it, whereas painted cloths are just something you buy like wallpaper. Now, I know you've seen so many, so many Tudor wall paintings while you were doing your research and, and over your career. So do you have any favourite ones or ones that stand out that still survive that perhaps people might be able to, to see today? I actually think the figurative ones are fascinating and there are quite a few good figurative ones that survive. You know, why do you paint a figure on the wall? Quite often they were self-portraits, a man and his wife dressed up in their best dress, one in particular at New Hall in Tickleton in Shropshire. We can date it to about to the early 1580s. Now the guy had just acquired gentry status, he'd just been granted arms, he'd just got married, his wife looks as though she's pregnant in this sort of portrait and they're in their best clothes and they're looking very pleased with themselves. Yes, she's holding a lute, you know, so that's displaying your gentry status. So there's there's a few figurative ones that are very clearly giving out messages. And there's another one, which is, again, telling such an interesting story uh, at the Forge, which is a museum in Much Haddon in Hertfordshire, which is, it's the Judgment of Solomon, right? And you've got Solomon, uh, supposedly, sat on the throne. You've got a, a man there with a sword and you've got a baby about to be chopped in half and you've got the mother pleading on the ground. But when you look at it closely, Solomon is actually Queen Elizabeth. So it's flattering the Queen, depicting her as wise, you know, with the judgment of Solomon. It was painted for a progress that she made into East Anglia in the 1570s. It's fascinating because there's a couple, there's courtiers stood round so you've got the, the clothes that the courtiers were wearing. It's got lots of information on 
contemporary fashions. They look like the Kitsons who, from Hengrave Hall, who she'd visited just prior to going to this much Haddon one, and very similar to the portraits that are available of them. So there's so much going on, so much sort of coded messages within this. So I think the figurative ones are actually important, telling us something about life at the time, which we can't access any other way. That's what I find so fascinating about them. There are sort of things that people were thinking about and feeling are expressed in what they chose to put on their walls to communicate to other people. And I think the figurative ones particularly illustrate that. And the very last thing that I ask all my guests on Talking Tudors is for a Tudor takeaway. So this is something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode that may just deepen their understanding of what we've been discussing or the period in general. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? I do. I do. I would encourage people to, you know, look up some of the buildings um, that have got wall paintings. So I mentioned the forge at Much Haddam. And if you, uh, that's sort of haddammuseum.org.uk, you know, they've got pictures of that and information on it. Old Three Hall in Wales, that's a very interesting early one of a man and his wife. Paramore Grange, which is in Kent, that's again got information, which is very clearly what a typical wall painting of the period was. Acton Court, which, you know, you would know about, that's got one of the earliest antique work wall paintings. And again, that's if you if you look on the internet, Acton Court's got a picture of that. That shows very clearly the sort of Renaissance painting that came very popular because it's royal instigated by sort of Henry VIII. He was the first one to use it. Other courtiers copied and then it, anybody who was anybody had it, you know, in their room. The headmaster's chamber at Eton has got a really early wall painting which shows the difference between the typical ones I've been mentioning, and that's on Historic England's uh, website. Pittleworth Manor has got some good images on it, on their website of, again, a very typical wall painting. So those cover the sort of range of, of paintings that I've been talking about. Wonderful. And I'll, I'll make sure to add some links to those to our show notes so that everyone can find them nice and easily. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk tutors with us. It's my pleasure. It really is. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.